Welcome to my top five uses of classical music in cinema. This is a list with a twist. I'm going to pull a fast one on you at the end, so stay tuned for that ambiguous pleasure. Some house rules. Firstly, I am not talking about scored music here. Shostakovich, Vaughan Williams, Prokofiev and many more scored music for films. Here, I'm talking about classical pieces which are then used in a film. Second rule, no music from films that are about music. That felt like a cheat, which meant rejecting lots of scenes I love. And nothing from Amadeus, not even a... I'm a big cinema fan, so this was a hardest to compile. The film has to be good, the music has to be great, and the joining of the two must be brilliant. Talking of which, at number five, a gem and a classic. Welcome to the famous scene when convict Andy Dufresne locks out the guards and plays Mozart to the rest of the prison yard. A beautiful rising shot to show beauty rising over ugliness. There's loads of great things about this scene, but I love the way music is part of the actual action of the scene and not just the window dressing. I love the way it describes how music can elevate our lives. And I love that line, I have no idea what those, what those two Italian ladies were singing about. Music operates at a deeper level even to language. Yes, the marriage of Figaro is brilliant, but you don't need to know the intricacies of the plot to know that this just sounds beautiful. I like to think they were singing about something so beautiful it can't be expressed in words. Exactly. I'll just shut up. At number four comes another classic, and indeed, a cinema cliché. Well, clichés become clichés because they're just very true and everyone says them a lot. It's a perfect choice, a blissful marriage of sound and vision. The references are all on point. The Valkyrie represent airborne attack for the original composer, Richard Wagner. He scored the violin so you can actually hear the wind rushing through the scene. There's musical history here, but cinema history too. As I'm sure Coppola knew, this is not the first time this music was used in a cinematic assault. Adapting music like this for a film was, at the time, revolutionary. However, the film's heroic portrayal of the KKK, and let's just say that hasn't aged quite so well. Griffith's film contains none of the irony packed into Coppola's punch. Hey, what a shot. Amazing stuff. At number three comes one of those tracks that refuse to stay on the cutting room floor. This is one of those everything is perfect moments in a film. I love the film, I love the track, and I love its use in this particular scene. The anthemic music contains a sense of revelation that's perfect here. That realisation that there's a truth operating beneath your everyday reality that's perfectly encapsulated with Philip Glass's music. It's a proper revelation. Oh, and the revolving music with those revolving doors. Yeah, that's perfect too. The story goes they never intended to use this track in the film. They'd used it in the edit suite as what's known as a guide track. In other words, just temporary. This music itself had been composed for another film a decade earlier, Paul Scrazzi, but they could never find something to better it. So they just decided to turn their temporary music into permanent music. Right choice, I love this moment. All of which means, next, at number two, There's something beautiful and disturbing about Terence Malick's choice of Orff's music. The music itself is innocence personified. Composer Karl Orff literally wrote these pieces to teach children music. But Orff also had a different history, a different life under which he wrote different music. <laughs> This is Excalibur, John Borman's film, which nearly made this list. It uses strong Teutonic music to convey its blood and fire. 
Prime amongst those tracks is Karl Orff's 1937 Carmina Burana. In Germany, under Hitler's Nazi regime, this was a huge hit. And its supposedly pagan music has become since associated with Nazism. After the war ended, controversy swirled around exactly how Nazified Karl Orff had been. When we find him writing these children's pieces nearly two decades later, you can almost hear the relief in rediscovering innocence. All of which means there's a tension here. There's blood lurking in the background, behind this innocence. And this is teased in Terence Malick's brilliant film. The music can be sweet and pure, but also jarring. So, at number one comes... Well, I have to confess a cheat here. You see, at this point, it would have to be a Stanley Kubrick film. In fact, more than one Stanley Kubrick film. In fact, if I'm totally honest, there's an entire top five Stanley Kubrick films that would make number one in this list. So, in the spirit of not wasting resources, I'm going to make a separate video for next week, a list of Stanley Kubrick's five greatest moments. Which means apologies to our number one here, whom I've kind of now knocked back to a number six place. But anyway... Here it is, my number one classical music used in a film that's not originally scored for it, and that's not a Kubrick film. It's... The choice of Marla for Visconti's film is perfect. That lush, almost decaying late romanticism is baked into the film's meaning, delivering that sense of unrequited love, beauty, decay... And yes, death. Parts of the film have not aged quite so well. Not the homosexual themes I think the filmmakers were more concerned about at the time, but rather the inappropriately aged content. There's something a bit creepy watching Dirk Bogard traipsing around Venice ogling this younger beauty. There's also a few rather cheesy intellectual scenes that the film could do without. Art is the highest source of education. And the artist has to be exemplary. However, music works brilliantly with image. And Visconti helps that music with an often fiercely naturalistic soundscape that can sound harsh. So when the Marla comes in, it feels like we're transcending a reality. And the images just back that up because they are stunning. It's visionary and it's brilliant. So that's all on the list. I'm sure I've missed some classics, so do let me know in the comments section. Although, trigger warning, I reckon some of those choices are going to appear in my video in two weeks' time about the worst uses of classical music in cinema. Until then... Please like and subscribe.